Good morning. Thank you for coming and welcome. We basically ordered a really perfect day for you today. Uh, good weather and good company. So let's get started. Um, those who require the learning objectives, uh, I mean the CEU credits, please make sure to sign up um, up front. Uh, there is a sign up sheet and make sure that you get in your times um, when you get in as well as clock it out at the end of the day. The list will be available at the reception, so make sure you do put that in so that you get your credits. Your other learning objectives. So we're gonna start with the opening remarks. We have Naomi Maralio, who is a principal with uh, Architectural Resources Group and is going to represent California Preservation Foundation today for us. She's a board member over there. She has designed numerous award-winning projects and it includes um, several projects at uh, the Culinary Institute at Greystone. Uh, she also has expertise in working with a lot of adaptive reuse buildings and uh, Naomi's professional background is augmented by training in architectural conservation at the International Center for Conservation in Rome, Italy. So please give a warm welcome to Naomi. Thank you, Sapna, and welcome. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. And uh, on behalf of the California Preservation Foundation, um, better known as CPF, um, we really appreciate the chance to kind of kick off this day. I know there's been a lot of uh, time and effort and years of uh, waiting for an actual in-person uh, opportunity. So um, happy to kick this off and to really, it's a day to showcase all of the great work that uh, has been done here at Stanford University over many, many years. And also to celebrate um, the artisans and craftspeople who have uh, collaborated on that work. So. Um, it's going to be it's going to be a great day. So just a little bit, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about CPF for those of you who might not know uh, much about the organization. We are a statewide organization, and we advocate for um, preservation of the uh, cultural history, diverse cultural history of California, and the places that make it special, the historic properties. And we do that. Oh, hold on. And we do that three main ways. Number one being advocacy. We are in the halls of uh, legislature in Sacramento and uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, working on initiatives and legislation that affect um, historic preservation. And most recently here in California, we were successful in um, obtaining the state historic tax credit, soon to be um, live for applications. but. We're now the 37th state that offers that uh, incentive, uh, monetary incentive for preservation. Um, secondly, uh, we have a robust educational program, and this is really the cornerstone of CPF, sharing best practices, professional knowledge, and innovations across webinars, um, primarily webinars over the last two years, but also just getting back into workshops and uh, seminars, and then an annual conference which is in June this year, that will be a hybrid um, situation. Uh, so an annual conference uh, kind of caps off the educational programs. And then we also like to celebrate uh, successful projects and um, recognize the professionals that work so hard throughout the state. And so through the Preservation uh, Design Awards, we recognize those efforts. And so while we were um, recognizing those efforts, uh, we wanted to really highlight the, um, just the long-standing relationship that CPF has had with Stanford University. And as you can see here, numerous projects over the last 32 years have been recognized for excellence. Uh, beginning in 1990 with my personal favorite, the Stanford Stone Study. Um, I was involved in that project, kind of fresh back from the Rome program and uh, all the way um, through the years, many of the projects that you'll see today uh, were recognized as well as recent ones, major projects at Old Chem and the Robel Gymnasium project. So over the 32 years, 14 projects, that's um, pretty exemplary for an institution. 
And then also, um, we've worked together very closely with Stanford on um, other programs and some of the educational work that we've done. And uh, in 2018, the conference, the annual conference was here in Palo Alto, and Sapna and I did a, a day tour of um, campus facilities that had been rehabilitated after um, the earthquake. So as we were looking, kind of compiling these um, award-winning projects and programs that CPF and Stanford have done together, uh, we were reflecting on what makes Stanford so special in its, um, in its treatment of its, its, its historic resources. And it really is an exemplary uh, institution for a number of reasons. And uh, compared with peer institutions and other facilities with uh, a lot of historic resources. And standing out among those attributes, number one, is just the stewardship and uh, this commitment uh, and the value that's placed on being caretakers of a legacy. And it's collective. It's not any single person. People do come and go, it's a, but it's an attitude of the university. And it isn't easy. There's a wide variety of building types, wide variety of materials, artwork. Um, you know, their day job is to run, a, you know, a top-notch university facility management. Um, and so this is kind of the added, added extra burden, but um, just exemplary example of stewardship. And then the other thing that came to mind it was just their resiliency and uh, not, you know, surviving not one but two major earthquakes in the 1900s and, uh, and recovering in a really special way. So in 1906 earthquake, uh, you know, the university suffered tremendous damage during that earthquake. Just a few illustrations here. Um, buildings did collapse and um, the recovery was, uh, it took a long time, not not every building was reconstructed, but there was a, a resolve to kind of honor the um, original vision for the campus, and so commitment made to restoring many of these buildings, and then also building safer um, from that point on. And thought leadership came out of the university and the engineering departments uh, where research was done on earthquakes and how to um, come up with engineering solutions to kind of withstand, um, withstand them. And then, facing it again in 1989 with the Loma Prieta earthquake that many of us uh, remember very well. And in contrast to the 1906 um, uh, damage, there no buildings collapsed. The university, they, I think, was only closed for one day. But the, um, the damage was widespread. And as you can see here, um, there were many buildings that were closed. And the challenge, again, um, facing the university of, of how to rebuild or how to repair. And uh, I remember very clearly, these were not easy discussions. And there were definitely threats to certain buildings. But over a 10-year um, period, uh, the buildings were rehabilitated. The damaged buildings were um, reoccupied. And, uh, and it was recognized, this program for um, uh, recovering from the earthquake was recognized through numerous um, awards and publications. And uh, um, yeah, it was something that everybody should be proud of. So the, the third and last that I'm going to talk about is really kind of why we're here today um, to celebrate this work. And that's the relationships that uh, the university builds with the artisans and craftspeople and designers and engineers um, that work on these amazing buildings. And these are long-standing relationships. A um, couple of the people here today were involved with buildings shortly after the earthquake. They are still involved um, with these buildings. And what that has done is fostered a relationship of uh, well, where there's great continuity, there's great teamwork, and there really can be um, amazing innovations um, that evolve. You know, the solutions, sometimes the first solution is not, was not um, successful or as successful as everyone wanted. And so these, it, there was a real evolution that I've seen. And so I think we're here to celebrate some of those relationships, but also just to acknowledge the um, how they've been fostered by the institution. So... 
That brings me to the end of my remarks, but um, welcome and enjoy the day. I think that there's some really exciting things in store for you. Thank you. I'm going to do the overview connecting the past, present, and future and introduce you all to the artisans that you all are going to meet this afternoon during the workshops. It's my great privilege to stand in front of you and talk on behalf of the hundreds and thousands of people, or hundreds and thousands of hands, I want to say specifically, who have helped shape this university and helped steward this, um, this vision uh, for the uh, legacy that was left behind by the founders Jane and Leland Stanford. Um, I'm humbled by the talent, love, pure dedication, and deep commitment that each has brought to Stanford. And you will see throughout that um, some of these relationships have lasted from the time of the uh, inception of the university, and we continue today to keep that relationship going. So to keep the discussion very focused, I have picked these five images to assist me in telling the provocative story of five types of building art that were going through a major transformation during this period in American history. Uh, during the presentation, we will pause at each image and examine it closely. I will focus on answering two primary questions. What is innovative about that art? And why do we need to preserve it? The afternoon workshops will take this examination further and explain in depth how we continue to preserve this art. Not any less innovative you will see. So starting with Memorial Church and the mosaic art. The first image. So what do we see over here? Let's just describe it briefly. There are six men at each table with small square paintings in front of them and a few trays of colored stone. The studio is actually in Venice and Salviati Mosesis are the people that you are seeing. They, what you're seeing over here is a pioneering backing method that was developed by Sal, uh, Salviati during this period in history. And what is important to see is that prior to this time, this image would have been very different. If you were during a Byzantine time seeing Moses's work, they would all have been standing on scaffolding, putting the you know, pieces of stone onto the facade. Instead, what you're seeing over here is these mosaicists are actually sitting in a workshop environment. And this is the first instance of like mass production and transportation that we take for granted today. So zooming into the picture, here is one. You can see the little backing square in front and he's taking individual pieces of glass. So tesserae or tessera, singular plural, is actually a piece of, two pieces of glass with a gold leaf in, in the middle, which is compressed in, under heat. And that's what makes the, the little stone piece. And you will see some examples of this. But the, the image on the left and the right shows it's 50 years apart. It was a, uh, somebody walking through Venice and came upon the Salviari studio and found that all this work that has been going on at Salviari was also prevalent 50 years ago when they were working at Stanford, um, right at the inception of Stanford, creating these big mosaic pieces that you will see. Um, and, and it was mostly because of this uh, innovative trans, uh, you know, square pieces that they could actually transport across the whole world and promote this art across the world. So going back a little bit to the history, um, during the Byzantine period is considered like the, the golden age of mosaic art. And of course, uh, the, the art got transported to Venice when uh, you know, they were persecuted and they, were, they transported themselves and immigrated to Venice. Then they, during the Renaissance, it, bec it became a highlight of the Venetian period as well. But it changed very um, dramatically, as you can see. The art was very abstract before. And during the American Renaissance, it turned into a more of a realistic art. And what you see on the Memorial Church facade is actually 
many, much more color intensive than what it used to be during the Byzantine period. So here's where the Salviari studio was located in Venice. They had multiple places. It still exists and we're still in you know, conversation sometimes with them. Here are some images of how it all started. The, the image on the left you see is a huge life-size um, painting by uh, their chief artist and then they would cut them up into smaller pieces and then on the right you see him assembling those pieces and this is still in Venice, but the next slide here, you see them now at the front facade of Memorial Church, uh, where they are taking each of those squares, putting mortar at the back, applying it onto the facade. And the next image shows something that they did very beautifully, which was in order to create a very hand-crafted um, look, what they did was they, they touched each tile. And by touching the tile, they created imperfection in the tile. And that's how the light is reflected in all these various angles. It's literally playing with light um, through the mosaics. Of course, Jane wanted all the surfaces really adorned. And you will see, if you go into Memorial Church, you will see all the surfaces have some kind of art or the other including windows, including the walls. And there's a lot of mosaics, all different kinds. So this shows it as under artificial light, how the mosaics look. And then this is how it looks under natural light. There were two versions imagined for the front of the facade. The one on the top is a judgment painting, which Jane rejected, opted for the one below because it shows Jesus welcoming everybody to heaven. She strongly believed in the quote that I have put here, that um, we must not desire to begin by perfection. It matters li little how we begin, provide we resolve to go on well and end well. And this is actually uh, inscribed inside the church itself. They were very firm, both the founders, Jane and Leland, that giving education without actually giving a spiritual reason for that education was not worth it. It needed to have all the students have some amount of uh, spiritual uplifting. And therefore, this message is described front and center on our main facade and visible all the way from Palo Alto. As you come down uh, Palm Drive, you will see this mosaic. And this is when the church did not have actually all the mosaics. And just to contrast it, you can see how different it looks with the mosaics on the facade. And it, it, it also um, brings back that moment in time when the, uh, Jane, um, Leland Stanford, and their son were visiting Venice. And this was right before he passed away. So it is, it is a bittersweet uh, recall of their last moment together. And here is what Naomi talked about, the destruction that happened to the church in um, the 1906 earthquake. The steeple that you see collapsed into the nave and the front mosaic uh, fell to the ground in, in the quadrangle. And um, it was very unfortunate because the, the church was just inaugurated in 1903. And of course, 1906, it got completely decimated. Uh, but thanks to Salviari saving all the original uh, paintings and uh, drawings and everything, the mosaics were recreated and it took 12 men two years, twice, to recreate this 30 foot um, tall and 84 feet wide uh, mosaic art. So going from the mosaics, now we will go into the stained glass. And let's pause at this picture for a second and describe what we see. So what you see over here are two pieces of glass in uh, Mary's hands. Mary is our conservator from New York. This is in her studio in New York. And this is during the restoration work of um, 
the windows, which I will introduce in a second. But they, what, what you see over here is something very interesting and different than what used to happen prior to this uh, time in, again, history. Um, they, there are two pieces of glass. One is transparent. It has sharp um, details. Uh, it's in her right hand, as you can see. And uh, the one in her left hand is just showing, is, is an opalescent glass, and it is just showing facial um, uh, colors and tones. The way it works is when you put these two pieces of glass together, it creates this three-dimensional effect. And we are going to talk a little bit about it. This was a Renaissance moment in American stained glass um, windows. And there were many uh, artists working on this. And we have the largest collection of Frederick Lamb's uh, windows at the church. So to go back and understand what was so different about the stained glass, if you think of stained glass, you think of Gothic cathedrals and these you know, massive sheets of uh, stained glass, which serve as um, storyboards describing you know, different uh, episodes from the Bible. And they're not really windows. They're called stained glass windows, but they're not really windows because you can't look out through them. They are, they're window walls. And um, they equated light to divinity, and therefore, uh, the way the light penetrates through this, so it's actually transmitted light, unlike the mosaics, which is reflected light. This is transmitted light. And when you see this light, um, it kind of created this magical effect within the, the, the church and a special um, place for God, to understand God. And in contrast to this, if you see memorial churches' uh, windows and windows of this period were a lot more realistic. Again, it is, it is very, um, it, it is, as you can see, they, they have created almost a mural with glass, using glass as the medium. So to understand that a little better, you can, this is some picture at Sagrada Familia, to uh, explain how when light transmits through colored glass, it gives this specific colored light that comes, emits through it. Frederick Lamb um, used the glass very differently. He used it as a way a painter would uh, use paint. He just used the glass and light as a way to combine colors and create the special effect. Here are some images of his studio. Um, where he's sketching, glass cutting. Um, here is you know, him trying to pass it through the furnace so that the, the vitreous uh, enamel that is placed on the uh, clear glass actually fuses with the glass. And um, some more shots of his workshop. And this is a famous window again in his, this, this workshop is actually in New York um, in Greenwich area. And um, you can see him working with each of the pieces of, you know, either creating the hand or, and it's always done with the, the window backlit. Now we worked on three windows um, at Memorial Church um, and it was a mind blowing experience for me because when these windows were put apart, I did not, before this moment, I did not understand how complex they are. They're very, very complex pieces and it takes about a year to restore them. Now each of these is actually an interpretation of a painting um, and um, the Annunciation, the Flight into Egypt and the Home in Nazareth are the original paintings and you can see how Frederick Lamb interpreted these paintings into glass. Now the, the center one, the Flight into Egypt, I have just, for the sake of understanding, put all the three versions of this uh, window. The, I'm gonna take the laser pointer. This one shows the window lit with natural light from behind. This is when there is no uh, light, you're just seeing it in plain light. And then here is the backing of it. So each window has like a three version um, approach to it. And 
it looks very different backlit versus when it is just, you, you stand outside and look at it. And that's mainly because of the technique he used where you see the glass uh, very differently and the facial features very differently. Okay. So the next I'm going to do is the um, sandstone at the main quadrangle and you're going to meet the stone artist when you, uh, when you actually um, to do the tour, but I'm gonna just do a brief introduction for that. And for that, I'm going to use this image. Um, this, when you see this stone face, and it is located in the Memorial Court at Stanford, um, it is the, the plaque is dedicated to the volunteers who fought in the Spanish-American War. But, and you wonder, why is it looking so deteriorated? And this is because of weathering. And I'm gonna explain what, what, what I mean by weathering over here. So, sandstone has a very interesting relationship with water. Sandstone, if you know, is created by water. It takes millions of years to create sandstone. And it's ma mainly because of the stone being eroded, which you see over here. This is called tefuni where the stone is basically eroding um, naturally because of air and water uh, interaction with the sandstone. And it disintegrates the sandstone, transports it, which is actually called erosion. So the difference between weathering and erosion is weathering is where it breaks down, erosion is where it's actually moving to a different location. And some of the most beautiful sculptures um, in the world are naturally created by wind and water. Um, and it takes, like I said, millions of years. So Stanford's sandstone started off sometime in the Eocene era, that is about 55 million years ago. And at that point in time, the landscape must have been very different. Sandstone, uh, I mean, Stanford must have been probably um, submerged and we would have had to get to Stanford by a submarine probably. <laughs> and um, why do we know this? Is because we see these fossilized remains of um, the snail, which, which is evident in our sandstone and we know the, the exact locations of it. And this was a water snail, so we know that it is from this era, that's how they date it. Um, Eventually, of course, the tectonic uh, movements happened and the, the uh, Santa Cruz Mountains were formed. And um, we have our um, quarry um, in, in San Jose. And now this quarry doesn't actually exist anymore. Um, it's shut down and so we have very limited sandstone um, on campus and we treat it really preciously because it is not, um, as you know, it takes 55 million years to produce it. Um, so it's not, it's a very um, rare commodity and we use it very judiciously when we are doing repairs. But here I just wanted to show you all the location of the um, quarry. Of course now it's become very residential in that area and you can see the black and white pictures how it used to look before. Um, I have some more images showing the original stonemasons working on the sandstone. We have rusticated um, stone facades, and then uh, very judiciously uh, certain areas have been embellished with um, carvings. And as legend goes, um, Jane Stanford was very, very involved with these um, carvings. She used to have a parasol that she would walk around with, climb onto the scaffolding. On the parasol, she had a little marking, and with that, she would measure to make sure that there was enough depth in these carvings. Mm -hmm. So she was, she was a force. Mm -hmm. And um, it, is, it is very um, well known, too, that Richardson, who is um, the Richardsonian Romanesque architecture, that's what our architecture is called at Stanford, um, he was also very um, judicious about creating these carvings. His, his whole focus was on uh, compositions which were um, you know, in relationship to each other, 
but he judiciously put these carvings at various locations such as entrances to mark them out. Um, now, Richardson is not actually the architect who designed um, our um, sandstone campus. He had passed away, so his successor firm is, is uh, who designed it, and um, J uh, Leland Stanford had a lot of input in the design when uh, it actually got built. But we, we've, sandstone, like, you, like I said before, is, is something that, um, if not treated, it, it does perfectly fine when it doesn't interact with water. But the human, human hand has the tendency to add water where it shouldn't. So like when you see the right hand image, it is because of irrigation water actually hitting the sandstone and um, deteriorating. This is what, I mean, it looks like almost melting um, ice cream, right? And that's exactly uh, what. And on the left hand side, you see all the uh, biological growth. This is lichen in the air that kind of loves this stone and cap, you know, settles on it and is a parasite and basically deteriorates the stone over time. And we've been working with the stone mason to do a lot of um, repairs. Here you can see some of the deteriorated columns and Dutchman improvements that you will see this afternoon. Um, and it's always a question, should we use a patch or should we do a Dutchman um, repair? Dutchman is when you actually take a piece of sandstone um, and you like the root canal or putting a cap on your teeth. It's like you just add it to the, the stone and that's what you see in this particular image where you know all the deteriorated sandstone has been removed and then a dutchment has been added. Um, again, we're very judicious when we do this because sandstone is in limited supply for us. So we make sure that we don't um, overuse this. Uh, where we can get away with it, we, we usually try to do the patchwork. And that's what you see the two um, people from Stone, Stone Sculpt doing. Uh, that's a patch, sandstone patch. So next coming to the um, final uh, workshop that we're going to have at the main quadrangle, which is about the um, terracotta and clay tile um, terracotta roofs and um, the concrete floors. Now, talk. This image, what does, I wanted to pause at this one. So these are sewer pipes. Why are we discussing sewer pipes over here? Um, it's, it's because this was the time in history where Gladding McBean is a company that developed in this time. It is located in Lincoln, still exists. We still have a relationship with them. And um, they used to be producing, there was a rich deposit of clay that was discovered, and it has this unique color. And um, therefore, this company emerged over there um, in Lincoln, and it was on the Oregon-California railroad line, uh, which you can see on the, so this is the plant that developed. And um, because of this rich clay deposit, um, they started making sewer pipes. Now it seems Mrs. Stanford and Mrs. McBean used to meet occasionally for tea. And Mrs. Stanford was in the process of getting her university built. And she said, well, why can't we use your terracotta tiles for our roofing? And that's how this relationship developed. And here you can see, this is one of their ledger entries from 1902, I believe. Uh, where we have like six or no, nine entries of um, Leland Stanford University's uh, uh, terracotta purchase orders. And in addition to Mrs. Stanford, you can see that uh, Charles Hodges and Clinton Day have also ordered terracotta tiles. So Clinton Day was the architect for the main church. And here is some of the images of the construction on the roof of the church. And we have a whole wide variety of um, clay tile types. Um, the church in particular, because of its conical roof, has a whole um, mold process that we have to kind of be very mindful of because 
We have to keep, if we have to recreate, we need to recreate them in a certain color. And uh, Hoover Tower, for instance, has flat tiles, and then the rest of the uh, university has what we call Spanish tiles or barrel wool tiles. And here are instances of us you know, cleaning them. And since then, um, Gladding McBean has created, this is what we call the Stanford Blend, which you see over here. And it is a particular mix that we use for all tiles. And we still, like I said, have a relationship with the company and they still uh, deliver our tiles 125 years later. And then the last one I have for us is this dual tone artificial stone. And this is the image. So the image on the left is actually in Venice and again, St. Marco. And what you see over here is the um, flooring over there, of course, in Italian marble. What we have tried to do on the right-hand side at Memorial, I mean, at the main quad, is in concrete. But I think, again, when the, when the founders were originally trying to recreate that, that last time in Venice together, this might have influenced, it's a conjecture, but it might have influenced why the colors are the way they are. And the person who laid most of our um, concrete floors is um, a gentleman by the name George Goodman. And he was actually responsible for not only laying the Stanford uh, concrete floors, but he was one of the main people who laid a lot of the paving across Oakland, across San Francisco. He, he got really rich doing all this paving work. And I believe in Oakland, as well as in San Francisco, there are many stamps of George Goodman because he, was, he had a patent that he uh, developed. Um, and it was in innovative at this point in time. Uh, this is the patent. It is called the Schillinger patent, uh, number 105599. And what it was is, and you can't see it very clearly, but there are little specks that you see over here at the top of this um, paving cross-section. Uh, what he developed was a tar paper separation between the, the paving pieces. And by creating that separation, what he claimed, and it is true because we, we do take off each tile sometimes, is that that separation enabled, if one tile was broken, you could easily remove it without affecting all the other tiles. And this was the pattern that he created. Now, of course, at this point in time when we do this, it is pretty ordinary, you know, it's, we do this all the time, it is not a new thing, but he, at that time, you can imagine 100 years ago, where he was um, developing this, and it actually turned into a fight um, um, later on because it was used without his permission, and he didn't, so there is a big case at this point in time, and Olmsted was also um, specking this particular um, mechanism of putting floorings together, um, and they were all dragged into this case. Here are some newspaper articles of, you know, singing his praises about how good he was in terms of um, all the work he has done and how professionally he did it. And we've, of course, since then had a lot of uh, cracking. Some of it is, again, man-made because we would run huge equipment over these, <laughs> these paving materials which were not meant to. And of course, I don't blame them. Half the quad fell down, so it's possible that you know, they, were, they were trying to um, resurrect the quad you know, at that point in time, not using the best uh, protection techniques. We've gotten very smart since then. We put lay down plywood everywhere where we, we start work. Um, and we've been systematically actually uh, repairing this. So now it is my pleasure to introduce each of our speakers. I don't see Oleg still over here, which concerns me. <laughs> but um, I am going to introduce um, each one. These are the three workshops that you are going to visit in the afternoon. Um, Memorial Church, the, the mosaics and the stained glass um, will be um, the 
the, uh, at the library, not at the church actually, because um, we are going to see some of the original artwork um, that was produced and some of the um, uh, tile work that is now in the archives. So you will actually see all, the, all of that at the library. Um, so Leslie Bone has spent her entire career as the objects conservator. Uh, she has been, she started her career at the British Museum in London, and for the last 40 years she has been in the Bay Areas, uh, working with the Fine Arts Museum in San Francisco. Uh, since 1983, she has also worked on various projects for different departments at Stanford University. These have ranged from working on individual objects at the Stan uh, Stanford Museum to acting as a consultant for historic materials for various building restoration projects around campus. More recently, she has been affiliated with the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital as their contact, uh, contract conservator, taking care of their varied art collection. She's also worked on the uh, Cantor Museum. Um, but her longest and most beloved association has been with Stanford uh, Memorial Church, where her, she started, as you can see, I want to say like a young girl. <laughs> and she's been working nonstop um, at, the, at the church. So I want to invite Leslie up front and introduce her. And I have created a little slide if she wants to just outline any um, things that you know, they're going to see during the workshop. Hello, welcome everybody. Um, yeah, I'm the, I'm the old person here on campus. My first project was in 1973, I think, working on the church on the plinth that Mrs. Stanford lovingly brought back from Europe, uh, probably in 1900, in memory of her husband, and it's dedicated, I think the dedication is 1902. Um, and since then, I kind of haven't been able to get off campus, it seems to me. Um, Anyway, I've worked with David, I've worked with Oleg, I've worked with um, several other people. Um, and uh, it, it's been really interesting for me, it was interesting to hear the first speaker this morning because when I first came to campus, um, the approach to the repair and restoration of buildings was um, very, um, it, it wasn't very thought through and it was very individualistic. So whoever hired you, you kind of went with them and if they knew somebody who could fix something that it would be fixed. So there wasn't a holistic kind of approach to the restoration of buildings. And I, a week ago I read um, a presentation I gave actually in uh, 1990 about the work, the, the restoration work on Stanford Church. And it was interesting to see that the e at the end of that talk, I make a plea to the university about um, you know, thinking about having um, a special um, guidelines for the work, especially on the more important buildings. Um, and I, I list about five things, and I, and I kind of read this list and I thought, wow, you know, the university really has followed through. Like, these five things now, thanks to people like Steve and Sapna, they're doing, you know? So, like, how great is that, right? So, uh, so for me, it's, like, really amazing to kind of go back and see this really positive and great progression where um, this, this legacy, this building legacy, has really grown and expanded and become really uh, something to admire. And thanks to the... the you know, the people that here on campus, are, as, as it said, this is not their main job. Their main job is to make a university function. Anyway, this afternoon, um, I'm going to talk about the more practical aspects of glass and the mosaics. So we will, I'll talk about the companies that Mrs. Stanford chose, about the, a little bit about the history and um, why, why, they, might, why were they, they were such appropriate choices by Mrs. Stanford. Um, I will talk about the, then her sort of relationship with them and how um, the artwork was uh, chosen and developed. Um, we will talk about um, how a window is made, how the mosaics are made. I'm hoping that David is going to educate you a lot about um, the mortar mix because uh, it is my belief that the mortar mix that the Venetians used here was uh, very much the mortar mix that David is going to talk about, the ancient uh, the use of cement, sand, and brick. Um, and I have an example that you'll be able to see, you'll see a real example from the first building phase. Um, it was quite interesting when they destroyed the buildings after the first earthquake to rebuild them. 
They threw a lot of the mosaics in the San Francisco Creek down by the shopping center. And when I first came on campus, I was told by many of the older residents on campus that it was like a Sunday tradition for families to wander down to San Francisco Creek and find like treasures, pieces of, of these mosaic tiles. It was like finding you know, gold or opals or something and that people had like little uh, collections on their windowsills of their homes. So we will see a chunk of that. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about you know, our guiding principles and how I've been involved in the care of the windows and the mosaics at the church. Um, I'm also happy to answer any questions that, that you may have. Um, we're really lucky that we have access to the library, so my talk will be looking at the, at the materials in the library, so that there are artistic materials that were used to help create the artwork that you'll see with David and Ollie, because they will be standing in front of the final artwork, um, but I will show you some of the the stepping stones that are still in a beautiful gouache done by Paoletti uh, and some, I think there's an oil painting that I found and uh, some of the documents that Mrs. Stanford signed. Um, and a wonderful, my favorite object of all is a day book that uh, we believe is, is um, Camerino's. Uh, and it, it's, it, it speaks a thousand words and it's just a, a, a treasure that the university has that day book. Anyway, I hope we'll have fun. I hope you have lots of questions. And I look forward to seeing you all in person later on. Thanks. Now, the next person I was going to introduce, Oleg, he's missing in action, it looks like. He's, he's solving a problem at his station. OK. Um, well, Oleg is one you know, who work, talks through his chisel. So. If you don't see him over here, that's okay. You're going to, you're going to see him with his chisel as soon as you um, go to the uh, front of the quad. And um, this is a photograph, actually, of his, some of his team members, but this is not a team member. This is a, he just sent this to me because this is a common problem that we have. People like to climb on the sandstone, so. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, whole, there's a whole tradition of students trying to do this. And then you all will see his, uh, his presentation uh, this afternoon where he will you know, talk about um, the deterioration of sandstone, why it happens, um, the, how, how he has learned the, the characteristic chisel marks of these original sandstone. Uh, masons, and uh, you will see how he holds the chisel. You may even get a chance to hold his chisel and and do some of that work. Um, the next person I'm going to introduce is um, going to lead the uh, workshop on the floor and the roof, and this is David Vessel, and here he is on the side of Hoover Tower, um, coming down the the side and repelling. We've done this together, actually. My, my, the highlight of my <laughs> uh, career at Stanford. And um, he's also going to talk with his team uh, about the floor work that we've been doing in multiple phases now over multiple years. So David, why don't you come up front and? Hi, everybody. You know, it's so interesting to me that we're having a conference at Stanford titled Architectural Conservation. It wasn't until 1970 at Williamsburg, Virginia, that a conference occurred that museum conservators such as Leslie and architects came together and decided to talk about buildings as cultural artifacts rather than just structures that we use for commercial or residential purposes. Out of that conference came a recognition that was that buildings needed to be preserved in the same way as museum objects. And hence the term architectural conservation was born. Now, it wasn't until the late 
1980s and early 1990s that the term architectural conservation really caught on. And then at that time, we see, for instance, with ASTM standards, we see the ASTM standard referencing architects, engineers, and architectural conservators. So for me to see the fruition of architectural conservation and see a, a conference dedicated to it is very satisfying. And I look forward to talking with you all about uh, th the tremendous commitment that Stanford has made. I also, uh, as Leslie have noted, this progress that we've seen here. And um, it's really been uh, a tremendous journey in working with the university. I'd also like to say at this point, thank you to the organizers. I knew where to park. I got here. <laughs> I was given a cart to get our materials up to the main quad, and um, it's just been, so far, a great experience. So thank you all. So both David and Leslie are very humble. When, when I started at Stanford, I was just thrown into the middle of the whole preservation, and I literally had, they had to hold my hand and walk me through everything. And since then, I've been trying to make sure that um, everybody who you know, is going to come forward taking this role from me in the future has everything documented, and we have these, you know, this knowledge passed on. So <laughs> they have such a breadth and depth of knowledge, it's unbelievable, and they're really humble about it. <laughs>